In Unit 1, Section 5, we're focusing on subatomic particles and how they interact with each other. Now, this story kind of goes all the way back to around 1897 when a scientist named J.J. Thompson was able to use something called a cathode ray tube to pass a, a ray of, of particles in there. And he had a positively charged metal plate and a negatively charged metal plate. And he noticed that things were being deflected in the direction of the positive plate. And so he realized that these atoms had negative charges in them. He called them electrons. And he didn't really have a very good grasp as to what they were like or how they reacted other than what you see here. But he, he did come up with a model, being the good scientist he was. He called it the plum pudding model. And his idea looked something like this, where he thought that these electrons were like these little um, pods or these little uh, bubbles that were kind of floating around randomly in the atom while the rest of the atom was this positively charged uh, uh, gel, for lack of a better word. It's called the plum pudding model because he said that these electrons were uh, randomly distributed, kind of like plums in plum pudding. So uh, that was his idea. Now, over time, this got refined. Ernest Rutherford, uh, about uh, 15 or so years later, uh, was in charge of an experiment where he propelled alpha particles, which are very dense, positively charged particles, at a very thin piece of gold foil. Now this is a little picture or kind of a cartoon of how this worked. He set up this gold foil here, and he had a, a device that essentially shot these alpha particles at the gold foil. Now in his idea, if the plum pudding model was correct, pretty much all of those alpha particles would have gone straight through the gold foil. Well, he found that that's not exactly what happened. As you can see in this little cartoon here, some, and this is kind of exaggerated, but some uh, of those alpha particles were deflected, and a very small fraction of these alpha particles actually were uh, almost reflected completely and bounced off of the gold foil and came back almost in the same direction as it was shot out from which was very surprising to him. He did not expect this to happen. So I guess the question is, why were some of the alpha particles deflected or even repelled by the gold atoms? Well, if we think about this, we know that the only way that anything can be deflected off of anything else in our uh, macroscopic world is if something that's of very high density hits something else of very high density, and they bounce off of each other. And he used this to, to, to reason and realize that you know these alpha particles had a positive charge, and they were uh, very dense. They must have been hitting something else that was positively charged and also very dense inside those gold atoms. And so that's why there was that reflection or that the deflection in the gold foil experiment. He realized that inside each one of those gold atoms, there had to be something that was very dense, something that was positively charged. He called that the nucleus. And he called those positive charges inside the atoms protons. And so this gold foil experiment was an excellent way to demonstrate that there are protons, and they're in this very dense nucleus of the atom. So slowly, this uh, understanding of the atom is being revised and refined. Now, we go backward a few years, and we have Robert Millikan. And he actually was focused on the electrons. He used something called the oil drop experiment, where he charged up these, these little tiny droplets of oil, and he was able to determine the charge of an individual electron. Uh, and he used this electric field in order to do that. So he calculated that the electric charge of one electron was about 1.592 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. So there we have that value. Very uh, ingenious experiment for all the way back there in 1908.
Now, if we go forward a bit more, we have Niels Bohr. And he was thinking about electrons as well. And his theory, his, his evidence, showed that electrons existed in these energy levels. And they were spinning around the nucleus. Now, he did not have an exact uh, idea as to what these energy levels looked like, but he theorized, or he hypothesized, I suppose, that they looked kind of like this, where these atoms had electrons that were basically orbiting the nucleus, kind of like uh, planets do in the solar system, This, these uh, circular energy levels. This was his idea. Now, today we know that energy levels don't actually look like that. That's not what they look like. But that was his idea, and this kind of gives us a model to work with. Now, one thing that he got very right on here was that electrons can jump. They can move from one energy level to another. And so this, this electron here, for example, in this first energy level, uh, it can jump to the second or to the third, or one from the third can jump to the second. But they cannot hover between levels. So they can be in the first they can be in the second. They can't be like floating in between. And that's something we call a quantized function. Something that's a quantum function exists in one level or a different level or a different level, but it can't be floating in between. It's kind of like steps on a staircase. You know that you can be standing on one step in the staircase or you could be standing on one above it or one that below it, but you can't levitate in between the steps. And that's kind of what we have here. You can have an electron in an energy level, one above it, one below it, but it can't be floating or levitating in between. And so that's what we're talking about when we say quantum in this context. It's a measurement or some sort of, of a function that, that exists only in discrete or complete steps, not in not not floating around in the middle or fractional amounts. James Chadwick was yet another scientist who discovered that there were uncharged particles along with protons in the, the nucleus, and that was in the early 1930s. These were called neutrons. We know that they have no charge, about the same mass as a proton. If you want to get technical, they weigh a little bit more than a proton, but but not much. And this was essentially the basis for nuclear science, nuclear physics. Uh, they were able to take this complete story of the atom, the protons and the neutrons, and to a lesser extent, the electrons. And within you know 13 years of James Chadwick's discovery, they were able to create the first nuclear weapon. So we have those scientists that helped us understand the story of the atom. Now today, we know that uh, atoms are composed of protons in the nucleus. Those are the positively charged particles. Uh, those have a mass of about one atomic mass unit. And then we have neutrons. Like we said, those don't have any charge. Those are neutral. And so that's why they're called you know, neutrons, because they're neutral. And they also have a mass of about one atomic mass unit. And then we have the electrons. Those are much, much smaller than protons and neutrons, and they're uh, buzzing around the nucleus in what we sometimes call the electron cloud. Now you can see how much smaller and how much uh, less massive they are than protons and neutrons, about 1 1820th of the mass of those particles in the nucleus. They have a negative charge. Now, this is a picture that you've probably seen before where you have you know, neutrons and protons in the middle, electrons buzzing around. There is a major, it's, I say that there's a little problem. It's actually a rather a major problem with this picture. And the fact is the picture is not drawn to scale. In fact, it's not even close to scale. Because if you wanted to draw or visualize an atom that actually was drawn to scale, you might need something that's about the size of this football stadium here. So let's imagine that we're going to make the model of an atom the size of that football stadium right there. Now, if that's the case, the nucleus is going to be a dime on the 50-yard line. So imagine a dime on the 50-yard line. Well the electrons would be grains of sand buzzing around 
in those outside stands. That's what you'd have to have in order to have an atom drawn essentially to scale. Now, that tells us that the vast majority of an atom is empty space. Over 99.99999% of an atom is empty space, which means you know, you're made of atoms, so almost all of you would be empty space. Almost all of me would be empty space. If you were to extract all the empty space out of a person, you'd have someone that weighed basically the same as they do now, except they'd be about the size of a grain of sand. And they would be pure protons, electrons, and neutrons. But, of course, that's not how a matter is in our, in our world, at least. Now, let's take a look at two relatively simple atoms. In fact, these are, for all practical purposes, the two simplest atoms that exist, hydrogen and helium. And you can see these, of course, these are not drawn to scale. This is just a little cartoon that I made to help us uh, visualize these. Now, imagine or ask yourself, from which of these atoms would it be easier to remove an electron? So think about that. And the answer is it is easier to remove an electron from hydrogen. And do you see why that is? We have basically two types of particles here. We have protons that are positively charged, and we have electrons that are negatively charged. I've left out the neutrons because they don't have a charge, and so there's no real uh, positive or negative attractive force there. So it's easier to take one away from hydrogen because there's less attractive force. There's only one positive charge here that's holding in the electron. Whereas over here, we have two protons that are holding in the electrons. Now, the idea here is that the greater the magnitude of the charge, the greater the attraction. So what we have here is what's sometimes called an electrostatic force. Basically, that just means the positive attracting the negative. And the more positive and more negative charge you have, the stronger they tend to attract each other. So these here in helium would be more strongly attracted, a plus two to a minus two will have a stronger attraction than a, a plus one minus one. So it's relatively easier or easy to remove that electron from hydrogen. Now let's look at two other atoms. We have hydrogen and helium, but let's, let's change gears here. And this time let's look at helium and lithium. So helium and lithium look uh, kind of like this. Once again, not really drawn to scale, just, just an idea here to help us visualize. I'm gonna ask the same question. From which of these atoms would it be easier to remove an electron? Now, you notice we have another factor in play here because it's true that we have a plus 2 and a minus 2 for the helium and a plus 3 and a basically a minus 3 for this lithium. But notice what else we have over here. There is a new energy level. This last electron in lithium is farther away from the nucleus. So since it's farther away from the nucleus, it has less of an attraction. It's kind of like having two magnets next to each other. And you know that if you have two magnets that are very close, well, they'll, they'll snap together very readily. But if you have those two magnets that are farther apart, well, there's less of an attraction. And it's kind of the same idea here. Uh, the greater the distance, the lower the attraction. So the answer is it's easier to remove this electron from lithium than it is to remove this last electron from helium. So I want you to think about those two factors we've just talked about. There's the magnitude of the charge and the distance between the charged particles. Now this brings us to a very important concept in chemistry that helps us understand atomic structure. This is called Coulomb's Law. And this is a, a law that we uh, use from physics. And the F stands for the attractive forces between any two charged particles. Now this K stands for a constant. But notice that we have two other 
uh, types of variables here. We have the Q. Q1 and Q2 are the magnitude of charge of each of the two charged particles. And then the D stands for the distance between the two charged particles. Now, if we think about this from a mathematical point of view, you can see that if these values for Q go up, then the force goes up as well. So what this tells us is more strong of a charge, greater magnitude of charge, means we have a stronger attractive force. So that's why the plus 2 and minus 2 had a stronger attraction than the plus 1 minus 1, like we had in that example earlier. Now d is for distance. And notice that it's in the denominator. So that tells us that if the distance is higher, you know, this denominator gets larger, that's going to make this whole value smaller. So what that tells us is that the greater the distance, the less the attractive force. And that tells us why lithium, since its last electron was, was uh, farther away, would have a lower attractive force. Okay, now this is just an introduction to Coulomb's law. We'll get more into detail with this and learn some more things about this in future lessons. This is just an introduction to it right now. Now, let's go back to these two atoms that we looked at uh, here a minute ago, and let's explain why it's easier for lithium to lose that last electron than for helium to lose that electron. So what is the deciding force? Is it the magnitude of charge or is it the distance? Well, you can see it's the distance. This, this electron here is farther away from the nucleus than we have in helium. Lithium's outermost electron is in that second occupied energy level. It's located a greater distance from that nucleus than in the case for helium in its outermost electron, which is only in the first occupied energy level. So as we think about Coulomb's law and the parts of an atom and how they're attracted to each other, this really helps us to understand how atoms and the parts of an atom interact with each other. Hope you enjoyed this lesson. Hope you learned something from it. And if you did, please give me a thumbs up. And I hope to see you again on my channel in the future.